All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur. Uh, I work on the Google uh, security team as an engineer. And uh, what my team does is we try to make sure that we don't have security vulnerabilities in our products. And as you might know, Google has a lot of web applications. Um, so you know, web apps are a big part of our world. And the second major thing that we do is we work with external researchers uh, that uh, get paid for finding vulnerabilities in our products when we miss something. So uh, this puts us in a position where we find a lot about new patterns and new flaws that, uh, that can affect the security of our web applications. And because many of our new web apps are built uh, using open source frameworks such as Angular and many other ones, we sort of learn about new and interesting patterns that can affect the security of possibly your web apps as well um, fairly quickly. Right after you know, we, we update code, we, we very often get uh, new data about some security flaws. So my hope for this talk is to, uh, is to share some of this with you. And I'm very, help, uh, I'm very happy that Anand already hopefully scared you a little bit uh, when it comes to security and the impact of uh, cross-site scripting bugs. So uh, I, my intent is to build up on this a little bit and show you some Angular-specific examples. Oh, and actually, before I start, uh, can you guys raise your hand if you know what Angular is or if, you, if you've written any Angular code in the past? Excellent. OK, this is music to my ears. Um, all right, so, uh, so let's get started. Um, so you know, this is a security talk, but this is JSConf, so I will not uh, tell you anything about like securing your database uh, or your backend system. So I'm not going to talk about server security at all. We're going to talk about client security, and client security here is making sure that the users of your web applications uh, don't get, uh, cannot get compromised or attacked. Uh, by evil websites or networks, right? And client security is a fairly broad area as well. And you know, it, if you want to have a secure website, you should have HTTPS and prevent a bunch of other things. But we're not going to talk about that in general either. Uh, and I will focus uh, on the biggest threat uh, that, that sort of as an industry of, of web application developers we've been facing since web apps have existed. Uh, and uh, sort of, I, I know this is a subjective view, but. Um, at, at least at Google, this is something that we are super concerned about. Um, so cross-site scripting. And also the other thing is that for the other flaws, the other common things that we are worried about in web applications, we have a relatively good way of preventing them. It might not be super straightforward, but if you want to prevent eavesdroppers from listening on your user's traffic and uh, getting access to your user's data in your web app, um, then uh, you, know, you, can, you can deploy HTTPS and HSDS, uh, and, uh, and you'll be fine. Right? Talk to a security engineer, they'll tell you what to do, it'll be OK. For cross-site scripting, uh, it's, it's not really that simple. There, is, there are no panacea that will, that will really prevent uh, uh, your developers from introducing cross-site scripting bugs. And uh, if you've been here for uh, Anand's talk, and most of you have, uh, you already know what cross-site scripting is. So this is just a super quick reminder. Uh, if, uh, if you Traditionally, the way cross-site scripting bugs got introduced is that if you had a, an HTTP parameter that you output to, the, uh, to your page without any escaping, right? So this, uh, on the top, you have a Python script. You, uh, you have a get parameter. You write it out. And then uh, what an evil website can do is they can uh, you know, point to that URL and make your user uh, execute an evil script. Uh, one example of an evil script uh, was, was something that Anand showed, which is uh, basically you can, uh, if someone gave, website, uh, gave webcam permissions to your website, they can transparently enable it and uh, sort of spy on your users. But it goes. And much beyond that, actually. So what the evil code can do once it's injected into your origin, into your domain, is it has full access to everything your user can do in the web application, right? And if you think about sort of rich ecosystems of applications, such as you know, any major web app provider, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, most of your apps, even the uh, horse drawing tycoon app that Curtis will talk about in, in the next session, uh, if you are, in, uh, as an attacker, if you can inject evil code, uh, you get access to, to everything that a web application has. And you can also attack other web applications that live in the same domain as the application that, that has the cross-site scripting bug. And the, the last sort of thing that, that we worry about in general is that in many cases, you can persist your access to a web application as an attacker after you are able to exploit cross-site scripting for a given user. 
So uh, what this means is that even you know, two months later, uh, after, even after the developer closes the, uh, the cross-site scripting vulnerability, the attacker might still uh, be able to retain some access to, to the web app. So that is super scary. Um, so, uh, but you know, the, the good thing is that traditionally, as JavaScript developers, uh, we did not have to worry too much about uh, you know, the, the uh, various ways in which you can uh, introduce uh, XSS into your web apps. Because when you purely write JavaScript code, there are, there are only a few APIs that that might be able to uh, lead, uh, that could lead to cross-site scripting, right? So things like uh, setting inner HTML, document dot write, uh, you know, eval when you set uh, URLs to possibly JavaScript, uh, when you allow setting JavaScript URIs uh, on, for example, window open navigation and so on. Um, so you know, if you you know, maybe five years ago, if you kept all of those in mind when you are writing your uh, JavaScript code. Um, you would be safe from, say, 95% of the bugs that, that would otherwise get introduced into your web app, right? Just uh, be careful with, with all those APIs. Um, but the, the thing that is different these days is that we don't really write web applications that use those uh, primitives directly, right? So it's, it's fairly rare. I mean, it's not like it, it never happens, but it's fairly rare uh, for, a, for a modern, well-designed web application to use document.write, for example. I mean, there are special circumstances where you might have to do that, but it, it's not that common. And the reason why this is the case is that there are many frameworks and many new APIs that were introduced to make our lives easier uh, as part of these big web frameworks so that we don't have to uh, use those sort of bare metal primitives like inner HTML or document.write. Um, and this is great. Uh, it, it really does make our lives easier. Uh, but it also makes it easier to use these APIs without really understanding it, right? Because if you have a framework that wraps around one of these uh, functions, uh, then you know you are still vulnerable to to the same class of issues, but even though you have not written code that uses the dangerous API directly. Um, so one of the the things that has been uh, one of the frameworks that has become fairly popular recently uh, has been Angular. And uh, to be honest, I'm sure that uh, almost all of you know way more about Angular than I do. I am not an Angular developer uh, or evangelist, for that matter. Uh, I'm a security engineer, and I know just enough Angular to try and break Angular-based apps, but not enough to build useful things with Angular. But that's okay. So hopefully, if you don't know too much about Angular. Uh, I'll be able to show you uh, just the, the bare things that you need to understand the code examples that we'll talk about. So yeah, Angular is uh, you know, pretty popular. Uh, so if j just in case you, you forgot uh, all about Angular in the 10 minutes since I asked you if you know Angular, um, th this is how it works. Three short steps. You, you include uh, the Angular JavaScript somewhere on your page. Um, then you write something that looks like HTML, sort of. Uh, so you, know, you, you write markup, uh, and you also have these ng attributes that, that uh, uh, allow your application to do the Angular magic, right? You can have loops, you can have uh, you know, data bindings, uh, the mustache syntax, which will be pretty important. Uh, in a few minutes uh, is also something that is, uh, it's not specific to Angular, but it's one of the sort of big uh, users of, of mustache syntax. So you write something that, that looks like a template, looks like HTML. And the last thing uh, is to define your application and controller uh, and bind the JavaScript that you write for your controller uh, to, the, uh, to the appropriate DOM element that has all these bindings and this uh, Angular syntax, right? Uh, so. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's fairly straightforward conceptually. Um, this, this allows really powerful, really cool web applications to be built. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of APIs uh, in addition to, so the template syntax is very rich. You can do a lot with that. There's components. There's a lot of APIs for uh, requesting data from the server. Uh, and you know, really lots of cool stuff. You can look at examples. It's great. Um, all right. So you know, if, uh, I've set it up a little bit. You know Angular. Uh, you know this is a security talk. So, so what, what's the deal? Um, so 
when you start using these frameworks, there are a lot of things that might look to be might seem to be very safe, but actually, when you when you sort of look more closely, it turns out there are subtle issues there. So, uh, and and the first issue that we've actually run into several times in several of our applications is what happens if you mix Angular and server-side template systems. So, I hope that most of you when you generate markup on the server, are using a template system. Because as Anand was saying earlier, this is something that gives you contextual escaping, so you don't have to worry about manually escaping every bit of data you know, for HTML or for JavaScript or for CSS, because you need different kinds of escaping. So the template system will, uh, will take care of all of that for you. right? So in, in the past, you would have a template. Um, you would render it. And even if you had uh, evil uh, inputs to your application, the template system would, by default, uh, just escape it uh, properly for, for the context, at least if you're using a good template, systems, uh, template system, and most, most reasonable modern frameworks use those, and you're fine. So, OK, so, so what is the problem, really? Um, so this is what happens when you, when you use a template system on the server side and Angular. So, the, the only difference here is that we've included some Angular elements in our template, right? We have the ng app, uh, and otherwise we just render it all the same. But what happens is, and this is in the bottom code box, is that the template system es will escape all your HTML meta characters, so you can't just inject HTML, but your server-side template system knows nothing about the mustache syntax that Angular is using, right? So, if you allow this kind of output, what it means is that Angular, when it processes the page after it loads, it'll, you know, it'll do its magic. Uh, it'll try to find directives in the Angular-controlled DOM element, and it will execute them. And what this means is that, as an attacker, you might not be able to inject straight-up markup, but you will be able to inject uh, Angular, uh, use Angular data bindings, execute arbitrary Angular uh, controller functions. So basically, do anything that, that uh, is defined in your Angular controllers. Uh, and also, uh, the sort of really big thing that, uh, that is not uh, often talked about is that it's possible uh, to escape out of the Angular sandbox, and once you can inject the mustache syntax into your Angular app, you can actually, you're, you're very close to executing arbitrary JavaScript. And this is something that is actually known, right? So if you go to the Angular security documentation page, they will tell you, you should not mix server-side templates and client-side templates because it can lead to those uh, sort of interesting interactions between the two uh, that will, uh, that will that can possibly make your app vulnerable. But there are good reasons to do this, right? Like, if you retrofit Angular into existing web applications, which are often generated uh, in part with server-side templates, uh, then you, know, you, you will have these issues. Also, if you want to pre-populate parts of your page uh, with data that the server knows about, and if you want to avoid uh, a, call, uh, a separate callback to get this data, you, uh, it's sort of natural to do this. Um, so this is, this is one pattern that is sort of uh, surprising and interesting. Um, OK, so let's say that we know about this. We, uh, we create our uh, Angular part of the page statically, right? We don't have any uh, server-side uh, template generation. So we just have a very simple application here, uh, which has just one image, an alt tag, and you know, it, it displays the uh, fav icon. OK, so you know, so far, so good. We have a controller. The controller has a, a dangerous function, uh, but we're not uh, executing it. So, you know, Everything is fine, uh, nothing to worry about here. So what happens if before we run Angular on the page, we insert and we run another completely innocuous JavaScript function? So what this function is doing is uh, it's just finding all the image elements on the page, uh, and uh, it's adding an alt attribute to every image. You know, it's, this is probably like a really crappy use of the alt attribute, and you should never do this. Uh, but you know, we, we're just adding some, uh, some data you know, image from our site. And window location is something that is controlled in part by the user, because you can open any web page with location.hash, the, the URL fragment at the end. So this is something that the user controls. But the alt tag, when you set it, the alt attribute, it's not a 
uh, sync, right? If normally, if you do this, nothing bad will happen. If you insert uh, you know, a script uh, tag or any HTML markup, it will, uh, it will not render. It's just like a bit of text. But what happens here when this interaction uh, appears is before Angular is invoked, after our function runs, uh, we will suddenly have this bit of DOM where you have an alt attribute uh, with data, uh, you know, so assuming that the attacker injected a, a bit of Angular markup in the URL, suddenly what Angular sees when it tries to parse the page is an alt attribute with a data binding. And it will look at it and it will think, OK, well, now this is something for me. I will execute it. Uh, and again, as an attacker, uh, you are able to inject uh, arbitrary JavaScript uh, and, uh, you know, and compromise the application. So this is, this is another example of an interaction where with, before everything would have been safe, uh, but because you're using a client-side powerful framework, you start having problems. Um, all right. So uh, let me give you another example. Uh, so one of the most powerful features of, of Angular and other similar frameworks are includes, where you don't have to have all your HTML syntax in line, uh, but you can include sort of sub-templates uh, and these templates will be rendered as part of your application. So it's, it's really great. Um, it, it allows Angular to fetch a little bit of, uh, of markup anywhere from the server, uh, render it in line, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's super useful. Um, so in here, what we're doing is we have this ng include that is based on the template URL variable in, in scope of the controller. So when we set the template URL variable, we're, we're just saying, OK, this is just uh, a pass to an HTML file on our server. Um, so you know, again, nothing to worry about. It's fine. The user language is controlled uh, by the user, possibly, but it doesn't seem like there's anything super wrong here, right? Well, uh, hopefully by now you know that all the examples are sort of tricky. So yes, there is something wrong, uh, and there is something bad that can happen in this application. So if the user can control this variable, part of the URL from which uh, Angular uh, loads the template, what they can do is they can add, uh, you know, it, and this is actually very reminiscent of an old class of server-side vulnerabilities where you have directory traversal and you point, uh, uh, you are sometimes on the server able to read files from different directories than you would expect. And here it's the same, but it's on the client. Uh, so when, uh, you know, this sort of evil language variable uh, is, uh, is embedded as part of the include uh, value, uh, what will happen is that this, this URL is, not, is no longer pointing to you know, at slash angular slash templates slash something. It can point to a URL on your uh, website that redirects uh, to, uh, to a completely external site that might be controlled by the user. And because under the hood, uh, what Angular is doing is it issues an XML HTTP request for the data. Uh, if the attacker's site uh, replies with all the cross-origin uh, headers, uh, the data that the attacker supplies will now be included as part of our application, and that can contain uh, HTML and arbitrary scripts. Um, and something that I should mention here is that Angular does have a mechanism uh, that will, uh, that by default prevents this from happening, but Angular also considers uh, anything under your domain uh, to be a trusted resource. Um, and to Angular, this URL, slash Angular, slash templates, and then dot, dot, slash, this looks like a trusted resource because it does point to your web server, and it has no easy way of knowing that Eventually, after the browser follows all the redirects, this can contain untrusted data. Um, so you know, by default, if you, if you use those kind of patterns, uh, your application will be vulnerable. OK, so another example. Uh, so you know, let's say that uh, just uh, hypothetically, uh, you have a horse drawing tycoon application, uh, and uh, you uh, you use JSONP in that uh, you know completely hypothetical horse drawing tycoon application. Uh, and so the way it works, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with JSONP, is you just have JSON data uh, wrapped in a callback. Uh, I have no idea why it's called JSON with padding. It doesn't look like padding to me, but that's that's what we've called it for a few years, so I guess the name stuck. 
All right, so uh, you know, this is how you use JSONP. Uh, in Angular, there's a, a convenience wrapper for, uh, for JSONP. You can just you know, call HTTP object.jsonp, and what will happen under the hood is the URL that you pass to, to this function uh, will be used as a script source, right? And if you think about what this means, uh, you would not manually uh, ever write JavaScript code that says, uh, you know, create a document, create element script, and then as a source, assign evil.com to it, right? Um, but when you use the JSONP API in a way that it's commonly used, which is especially for RESTful uh, uh, APIs, you say, I want to load JSONP from, from my server, you know, slash API, all these uh, sort of keywords that you expect, and then usually there is something that is potentially controlled by the user. So a name of your object, uh, uh, f uh, or f an identifier of your object. And if, you, and if you create a URL like this, it's the same kind of pattern that, uh, that we just saw with the uh, ng-include uh, example. Uh, basically, if, you, uh, if as part of the URL you have dot, dot, slashes, what will end up happening is that your application will fetch a script from using an open redirector, will fetch a script from an evil site, Again, uh, now the evil application cannot respond with HTML, but it can respond with an evil, uh, you know, straight up JavaScript. Um, so, you know, may maybe the JSONP API is not that common, but it, what it is, what is really common uh, in Angular applications uh, is the uh, HTTP GET API. Anytime you uh, want to retrieve something from your server or any external resource, you use HTTP GET. And you know, again, the same pattern uh, if you just want to load, say, JSON data, right? Not JSONP, but JSON or any other uh, thing that you generate on the server, uh, you, uh, you will have a very similar issue. And so, uh, you know, so this is actually a very common pattern that we see. Uh, and by itself, if you just do HTTP GET on a potentially external untrusted resource, it's not terrible because what will end up happening is that you will issue an XML HTTP request, your application will get the data, but if it discards it or does nothing with it, uh, you will be safe, right? Because the data, just by calling HTTP get, uh, you're not doing anything that is super scary. But what usually happens is that the data that you, uh, that you uh, obtain from the server uh, is used for something later, right? Like generating parts of the page. So in here, if we call inner HTML, uh, we assign inner HTML, and use any of the data that we've gotten from uh, what we think is our server, but is actually an attacker-controlled response, uh, we will again have a problem because inner HTML is a DOM sync and, and we have a bug. Um, but if you, you'll, uh, I'm sure you're thinking uh, about what I said before, which is no one really writes code uh, that uses inner HTML directly anymore, so this is sort of a fake example, right? Yes, it's a fake example, but what ends up happening much more common in practice is that rather than uh, using inner HTML directly, uh, what you end up doing is instead of, uh, instead of using inner HTML, you use some of the JQLite wrappers that let you create part of the DOM in JavaScript. So uh, JQLite is a, is a subset of jQuery that is API compatible with jQuery. Um, so you just get some of these uh, convenience methods like HTML, append, and a few others. Um, and uh, in here, if you, you know, get uh, data from the attacker, end up getting data from the attacker, and then you call append, this uh, sort of invisibly wraps around uh, the inner HTML DOM sync, uh, and uh, you might have a problem. So, uh, in the past, if I were a security engineer uh, reviewing uh, the code of a JavaScript application, I would you know, grab for an inner HTML, grab for a bunch of these other patterns. But in here, we have Angular and any other framework like that uh, sort of injecting their own wrappers uh, that do the same thing, but, uh, but are sort of hard for both the security engineer and the developer writing the code to understand that uh, you know, they're potentially dangerous. And there's no sort of big list uh, that you can Google and uh, uh, sort of know that, uh, that these function calls are dangerous. Um, so you just sort of have to keep that in mind. Um, and uh, so I've, I'm, we're almost done. We, I just have a couple of things to, to show you that are maybe a little less uh, used, but also interesting from the sort of, uh, sort of uh, 
new way of doing things perspective. So Angular and other frameworks give you direct access to some of the interesting parsing uh, functionality that the framework has to do. So rather than create a bit of HTML sort of statically and then invoking Angular on it, you can actually create a string in JavaScript and then call uh, interpolate and it will, and Angular will do the same thing as it would normally do on your page. So it will uh, substitute data bindings uh, it will render HTML. Same thing with compilant parts. So those are also things that if you p pass any untrusted data to any of those functions, if you manually need to call them for some reason, you will also have another uh, cross-site scripting bug. Um, and uh, you know, the final example that, that I wanted to, uh, to show you is something that Anand also mentioned earlier. And this is, this is probably the most common thing that, uh, that is likely to happen in Angular applications. In the past, uh, if you wanted to render some HTML uh, that, that potentially has uh, uh, JavaScript attributes are things that might be uh, dangerous in some way, but if, you're, if you trust that you control all the inputs, uh, you can say ng bind HTML and safe, and it'll be fine. Uh, but uh, this is a dangerous API, uh, because anytime you pass user-controlled data uh, to it, you will have a bug. Uh, now, Angular actually prevented this from happening in new versions. Uh, so now you just have ng bind HTML, which, which will bind default, uh, sanitize all the markup that you give it. So if you give it, for example, a script, it will just escape everything. But if you give it a bold tag, it will keep it because it knows it's safe. Um, but there's a whole family of functions that let you uh, trust bits of data as, uh, as HTML, basically tell Angular, OK, this is fine. Don't worry about it. Don't escape it. I've checked that it's correct. And this tends to be used improperly, sort of as a scary, uh, sort of with scarying frequency. Um, all right, OK. So uh, what's, like, what's the point of all this? Um, what I thought initially, as I was working on this talk, I thought, OK, I will try to scare you a little bit, uh, and, and then I will give you solutions for all these things, because you know, why wouldn't I? I, I don't want to be a jerk, right? I want to tell you how to write secure code. Uh, but uh, you know, in the end, I decided I, I'll probably be a little bit of a jerk and, and not tell you how to fix it. And the reason is that even if I told you how to address all these patterns that, that we saw on the previous slides, it would not uh, comprehensively cover uh, like all the uh, sort of sharp edges of the framework uh, that you might need to be concerned about. So you would uh, come out of this room thinking, OK, I know everything there is to know about Angular security. Uh, I'll avoid these things, and it'll be fine. But uh, sort of in practice, it, it's not like that. Because first of all, Angular is just one of many frameworks. And second of all, uh, there are many other things in Angular that we don't yet know about the framework changes. So, uh, so instead of giving you specific recipes or patterns for how to avoid it, I'll, I'll ask you to do three things, sort of to keep in mind it at a high level. First of all, read the docs. Uh, I know as developers, you know, we, we often want to just get things running. Uh, there's a lot of pressures. Uh, but if you want to have a secure application, usually what will really help is read the docs from your framework, and they will often tell you you know, what you have to uh, keep in mind and, or what you have to worry about. Uh, the second thing is talk to security people, you know, either in person uh, or on Twitter, and ask them, you know, I'm using Angular, what should I be worried about? Um, uh, because they, you know, we as security folks get super excited about these sort of minute trivia and details that lead to these problems. And uh, you know, actually, if you want to talk to me about this later, I'm super happy to do it because this, uh, no, I, I love to do it. Um, so that's the second thing. And the third thing I wanted to leave you with is uh, I wanted to show you that uh, these kinds of things can be like uh, that the sort of interactions between these components and the ways in which you can use new frameworks are, are super cool, uh, exciting, and it's fun to think about it, and it's fun to break your own applications. Next time you write code like this, think about whether it could possibly be vulnerable to one of the things I showed. And overall, this is just super fun. And I think it's almost as fun as a horse uh, drawing tycoon kind of game. And with this, I'll leave it to Curtis, who has the next presentation about something that I'm sure you will not guess what it is. <laughs>